For a long time, I've been interested in graph databases and how their unique structure allows us to view data in more flexible and insightful ways. That's why I'm excited to have Ben here today from Neo4j, the first data science platform to teach us a bit more about graph databases and the insights they help customers achieve. Ben, thanks so much for joining us today. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and about Neo4j? Uh, sure thing. So my name's Ben Lackey. I lead the uh, cloud partner architecture team here at Neo4j. That's working with our cloud partners to build integrations that are better together with their technologies and ours. Neo4j itself is the leader in graph databases. So our database is designed to represent natively not just data itself, but also the relationships between that data. Uh, this allows our customers to achieve insights that aren't possible with more traditional databases that often represent data solely as rows and columns. New insights, of course, means more data-driven decisions, which is super important for businesses. Can you explain to me what exactly is a graph database and what are the different scenarios that a graph database can be used for? Sure thing. So a graph database represents its data as a graph. And this is a graph in the mathematical sense. So nodes uh, connected by edges. In Neo4j, we call the edges relationships, which isn't the formal math term, but sort of a, a more friendly term. Uh, graph databases themselves can be thought of as solving three types of problems. So one of those problems uh, relates to journey questions. So you can think of things like a lineage. Uh, one very obvious example in that is tracing something through a supply chain. So from where it's, say, if we're talking about food, where it's farmed to where it's wholesaled to where it's sold to your dinner plate. Uh, and we do many use cases like that with um, shipping and logistics companies. Uh, sort of a higher dimensional example of that kind of use case is uh, complex pattern matching. So rather than just following something along a line, it's also possible with the graph database to make sense of whole webs of information. Uh, in the industry, this is often referred to as a knowledge graph. Uh, one example here would be one retailer we work with who has hundreds of millions of SKUs. And they have loaded all those SKUs into the knowledge graph so that it can power a conversational agent. And one of the examples I really liked that they gave us in a conversation was I, as a customer of that retailer, can go to the conversational agent and say, hey, does milk have zinc in it? The agent parses that question, consults the knowledge graph, looks up milk, looks up ingredients, uh, and then sees that, yes, milk does have zinc in it and can answer that question. So those are sort of two ways to use graph databases, the journeys and the complex patterns. One newer and more emerging way is with graph algorithms. So once you have that complex graph built up, that web of information, a knowledge graph, or maybe an operational graph, uh, it's possible to apply these really interesting algorithms on it to learn things about the graph. And that can relate to neighbors uh, within the graph. It can relate to centrality of nodes within the graph. Uh, or you can compute graph embeddings that are then useful in other systems. Thank you for explaining that. It's so interesting how many different types of problems graph databases can solve. Where does Neo4j fit in with Google Cloud? And what problem did it solve for us? Right. Uh, so Google Cloud has a whole bunch of different databases to solve all sorts of different problems. As part of that portfolio, if you need a graph database, uh, Neo4j is Google's answer. And this dates back to a program Google ran in 2018, where Google went out to market and selected ISVs, independent software vendors, who are the best at whatever it is in their space. Uh, for that graph space, Google had selected Neo4j, 
And ultimately, this led to a tight in-console integration for Neo4j, where you can go to the Google Cloud Console and deploy our software as a service product or a DB with just a few clicks. It's so cool to have a partnership that has been going on for a long time and that fills product gaps so well and really aligns to our customers' needs. Can you help us understand some of the customer use cases that you've solved using Neo4j and Google Cloud? Sure thing. So uh, fundamentally, what Neo4j offers is a, a horizontal technology. And what's really neat about that is it can see applications in all sorts of different verticals. Uh, one of the areas we probably have the longest heritage is fraud detection in retail banking. So graphs allow you to detect financial transactions that shouldn't be going on or fraudulent. Uh, one very common thing you see in fraud is something called a fraud ring, where somebody transfers money from one account to another account to another account, and all those accounts share information they should not. So the graph is really, really good at detecting that kind of thing. Similarly, we do a lot of work in supply chain optimization. Uh, one use case I thought was really neat uh, is with a um, cell phone manufacturer, and it's around logistics. So if you need to deliver, say, 10 million cell phones by January 1st, those cell phones are made up of a whole bunch of different components. And all those components might be sourced from different suppliers. Those suppliers, in turn, would have uh, prices that they can offer those components at, delivery SLAs, and then quantities of those components they can offer. So you end up with this very interesting graph optimization problem of which supplier should I procure from in order to meet that deadline of January 1st, 10 million phones, while at the same time doing that at the optimal price. One other area distinct from those two I just mentioned, where we do a lot of work, uh, is in drug interactions with pharmaceutical companies. Um, so modeling uh, different drugs and then taking inputs from uh, both tests and trials on the outcomes of what those drugs have done. Uh, the graph really allows you to uncover interactions that might be missed in a more tabular approach. Wow, it's so interesting, especially with the supply chain interaction use case, how you can trace every single little detail back and see all those relationships that you had mentioned and really know, like, this is going to be my best option for my business. So it kind of takes the guesswork out, which is really, really nice. So let's say I want to start using Neo4j. I need some help with my supply chain on Google Cloud. How do I get started? You had mentioned an integration before. Yeah, there are a whole bunch of ways to get started with Neo4j, uh, but probably the easiest, fastest, simplest one to get going is fire up the Google Cloud Console. And if you scroll down towards the bottom, there are uh, listings from a number of these different ISVs that Google has chosen to partner with in this really tight-knit way. And of course, Neo4j is among those. You can simply click on that and then click through the dialogues. And in a few minutes, you'll have a Neo4j Aura instance up and running. And that Aura instance is fully managed. So you don't need to worry about um, maintaining virtual machines or disks or network or any of that. All that management is handled entirely for you. Wow, okay, so you weren't kidding when you said tightly integrated. Literally within minutes, you can have an instance with Neo4j. That's super cool. So now let's talk a little bit about what's under the hood. I'm curious to know, like, what's a typical architecture that you see on Google Cloud? Neo4j itself is kind of made up of three components. At its core is the graph database. And then there are these two additional components, Bloom, a business intelligence tool, and graph data science, uh, which is really useful for data scientists. Um, one of the most common patterns we see is data coming from BigQuery. Probably one of the lowest touch, easiest ways to get started is simply to pull a CSV file directly in from cloud storage. 
that kind of gives you an idea of how you can pull the data into Neo4j. Uh, once it's in Neo4j, there are all sorts of really interesting things you can do. One of the use cases I'm probably most excited about is building up a graph within Neo4j and then using the data science component to compute something called a graph embedding. And a graph embedding is a, a tabular, a vector representation of the graph. And why that's really useful is that can then be taken and used in other systems. So one really common model we're seeing is pull data from BigQuery into Neo4j, compute embedding uh, so we can leverage all that structure and information about the graph, and then export that back out to Google's cloud storage where Vertex AI can make use of that new data coming from the graph to improve predictions. You're mentioning some customers build knowledge graphs. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and some different approaches? Uh, sure thing. So fundamentally, we're seeing kind of two different approaches to using Neo4j in a machine learning pipeline. Uh, one is this knowledge graph approach. And in that, you have examples like the SKU one I mentioned earlier, where a retailer loads hundreds of millions of SKUs and then does lookups with a conversational agent. Uh, similarly, there was another neat one where an insurance company uh, is using a Google product called Document AI to do something called entity extraction from claims data, basically extracting uh, who the individuals and other entities in claims data are, and then putting that into the knowledge graph and reasoning from that. So that's kind of one approach, the knowledge graph approach. Another approach that we're seeing a lot of and is more an emerging thing is you load data from somewhere else, some external system, BigQuery is very common, into Neo4j, and then you compute graph embeddings. So the graph embeddings, I believe Neo4j offers five different algorithms to do that. Uh, these are things like FastRP, uh, algorithms that came out of academia specifically to do this kind of thing. And in that scenario, data comes from some system, data lands in Neo4j, graph embedding is computed, and then the data is exported elsewhere where it's made use of by some downstream system that isn't even related to Neo4j. So we, we really see these two different patterns, either where we're an active system of record as part of the data pipeline, or we're contributing uh, some expertise based on the algorithms we offer. Oh, that's awesome. And then in terms of data science bloom, uh, this is a kind of visualization tool, right? Like a BI visualization tool. Can you talk about how that's used? Yeah. So kind of starting at 30,000 feet, you've got the graph database, which it's a database, you know, it has a query language, you can interact with that. You've got graph data science, which is these implementations of all these graph algorithms, uh, 50 some odd different algorithms for clustering, centrality, embeddings, things like that. And then finally, what you just mentioned, there's a technology called Bloom. And this sits on top of the database, and it's a business intelligence tool. And while some of our users interact with traditional business intelligence tools, you know, things like Looker, Tableau, Click, Spotfire, stuff like that. Uh, Bloom can be useful for particular use cases where you really want to take advantage of the graph data. And that's because Bloom is really the only business intelligence tool I know of that was built from the ground up focused squarely on graphs. So it lets you explore the graphs interactively, um, color nodes and edges different ways to better visualize things. And then one of the newest features uh, was just added oh, probably a month ago or so, you can actually make calls in Bloom into the graph data science component. So you can say, hey, give me a centrality coloring on all these nodes so I can see how central they are to the graph. That's so cool because it's it's efficient, but it also gives people the ability to take that information they have and then visualize it and get insights from it kind of in, in one go. 
you mentioned you just released this new feature. What do some future technical enhancements to the architecture look like or to um, you know the product itself? I mentioned these different machine learning workflows where we start with data, we put it in Neo4j, it feeds into downstream systems. We have that workflow pretty well put together uh, for training of a machine learning model using the embeddings and Vertex AI. What we haven't quite figured out today is how to do uh, the real-time scoring and what the best architecture is for that. Uh, we have customers putting together different approaches on their own, but we're trying to figure out what our best practices are there. So there are a lot of really fascinating discussions going on right now uh, about what the best embedding algorithm is to use and how we would feed the data in from different systems. We're trying to figure that out. And I, I think that's sort of indicative of what's going on with the larger space. That We're very much at the cutting edge here, and uh, there are a bunch of neat problems to be solved, and those have really high value if you can. That's super cool. Uh, is there anything else super cool or interesting that you'd like to share about Neo4j? Well, kind of in that vein, just the, the cutting edge thing. This is a very expensive, from a computational standpoint, uh, abstraction. So only very recently has it become computationally tractable to do things like compute centrality on large graphs and that kind of thing. We're at this very interesting tipping point where the door has been opened by advances in silicon, and now we're, we're figuring out how to take advantage of what that silicon allows us to do. It must be so interesting to be working in this field, in this company, where you're always at the cutting edge. Where can people go to learn more about Neo4j? Well, there are a, a bunch of online resources and classes and things. Probably the, the best place to get started is our Graph Academy, and that's just neo4j.com slash one word, Graph Academy. Very nice. So make sure to go check out the Graph Academy if you want to learn more about Neo4j. And Ben, thank you so much for coming on here and teaching us about Neo4j and graph databases. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. After talking to Ben today, I'm even more excited than I was before to continue to see the future enhancements around graph databases, graph ML, and everything that has to do with it. And I hope you're excited too. Thanks for watching and make sure to like and subscribe if you like this.